On my stream over at twitch.tv forward slash gar underscore seven, we complete various challenges throughout the week. Web app challenges, network challenges, and I make it a point to not just help complete the challenge and help you understand the concepts, but to me, the most important takeaway is what can I take from this lab and apply to my pen testing methodology? How can I actually find external entity injection in the wild? Well, I'm hoping to make this YouTube series to kind of take these labs and turn them into actual pen testing methodology. Now, hold on, before we get ahead of ourselves, you definitely want to at least understand what XML is and recognize XML structure. If you're not familiar with XML, we're not going to dive into it in this video. So I'll go ahead and link some references either below or here on the screen somewhere so that you can check out and kind of get familiar with XML before we get started. So external entity injection or XXE is a vulnerability that's exploitable due to a misconfiguration in the application's XML parser. So you'll see that the application parses XML and XML by nature allows for the declaration of things called entities. And these entities are essentially references to other points in the XML document. You can think of an entity kind of like a variable. So let's go ahead and take a look at an entity example right now. So here's a simple example of XML. On line 15, we have the XML prolog, which just talks about the version, the encoding, but it's on line 16 that the meat and potatoes pretty much start. You see that within that doc type declaration, we have an entity named gar. So anywhere we reference the entity gar with ampersand gar semicolon, this will instead evaluate to the string we defined. So in this case, the string example entity. So that was an example of an internal entity, but what about an external entity? Well, an external entity is similar, but instead of referencing something locally within the document, it references something external. So in this case, we can use a data URI, so something like file and then Etsy password or HTTP and then a cloud resource. And we can actually use this XML misconfiguration or XML parser misconfiguration to force the application to fetch these resources for us. And then in this case, because the application responds with an error containing the contents of that referenced entity, we actually get that resource returned to us. So in this case, when we change the entity gar from example entity to an external entity, so in this case, we'll do system and change this to file Etsy password. So something like this, send that along. You'll see that the application responds with the contents of Etsy password. So we change this gar entity from an internal entity to an external entity. And now we're able to exploit the vulnerability and access sensitive files. So as we go through these labs, I want you to think, why would I try XXE here in a real scenario? And we'll answer that along the way. Let's dive into that first lab. Okay, so we're diving into this first lab, exploiting XXE using external entities to retrieve files. So just like any application, we want to make sure that we're looking through the application both from the perspective of the browser, but also with Burp, because we want to make sure we're looking at those raw requests and responses. So as we go through this application, we see there's not a lot of functionality, some static images loaded. We click on view details. We see a product with a product ID. So we, we can look at that and think maybe type, some type of SQL injection or something like that. We see that there's a stock checker. When we click check stock, that sends a post request. And looking at that post request raw, you can see there's an actual XML payload sent here in the body. So we send that to repeater with control R we can now see the full request. And so here we can see we have total control over this entire XML structure. So from here, maybe we can declare some entities. So what we can do is we can declare a doc type. And then within that doc type, we can try to declare an entity. So in this case, we'll try to declare the entity test and evaluate that to gar. And let's see what happens when we declare that entity. So first questions first, if we declare this entity by itself without referencing it, does the application throw an error or does it still return the expected response? So let's send this. So we get the response that we expect. So what happens if instead of this product ID set to one, we instead reference our entity test that we declared up top. So now we're getting an error with our reference entity returned here. So invalid product ID gar. So instead, let's try to use system to declare an external entity and see if that works. So in this case, we'll do file Etsy password. And I need one more forward slash here. Well, there you go. So as you can see, the XML parser processed our XML and wherever that test entity was declared, it was referencing the contents of Etsy password. So because the application returns an error, returning the contents of product ID, the contents of product ID now have Etsy password inside of it. So that's why we get the results of Etsy password returned. So this one seems pretty simple. And I think lab two dives into a little bit more of what you can do with this in-band exfiltration of data. So lab two is actually pretty fun. In this case, we're exploiting XXE 
to perform SSRF attacks. And this is something that's pretty realistic. If you find XXE in the wild, sometimes you're going through local files and you're not finding a lot. But if you're on cloud infrastructure, then you can leverage this XXE to use an SSRF or send a request from the application's perspective to the metadata API. And so let's go ahead and dive into this here. So if we click on view details and check stock, we'll see we have another post request that contains this XML. So from here, we can go ahead and declare another entity. So doc type. So you can see here, we declared an entity just like we did last time. And let's see if our behavior is the same. If we do ampersand test and put that here, do we get the contents of Etsy password? In this case, we do. So let's say we peruse the file system and we're not seeing a lot, but we want to see if we're actually within any type of cloud architecture. Can this application server interact with any type of cloud services? So let's go ahead and change this file instead to HTTP, colon forward slash forward slash. So in this case, instead of referencing a local file, we're going to see if we could send a request to the metadata API, which is 169.254 repeating. Okay, so we sent this request to this metadata API and we're getting latest in the response. So what we could do is we can go down this resource path, latest, and follow that. That should give us metadata. And then I believe security credentials or IAM, let's see. IAM, yep. And then security credentials, most likely. And then the username of the credentials. And then from here, we have the AWS access keys. So the important takeaway here is what can you do with XXE? And that's perform SSRF attacks and also access local files. And this SSRF doesn't have to just be HTTP. It could be other protocols as well too. So that's important to keep in mind. Let's move on to lab number three. Okay, so this next lab is blind XXE with out of band interaction. So in this case, we're still able to declare entities within our XML post body, but the response doesn't return the contents of our entities. So the only way that we can actually exfiltrate data is going to be out of band. Let's break this lab down a little bit to talk about methodology and what we can do to actually exfiltrate that data. Okay, so as you can see here, same application, similar functionality. We'll go ahead and click on view details and then go to check stock. And from there, we should get a post request with an expected XML post body. And that looks correct here. So when we send this request, we're going to return the stock amount. So 903 units. And what we'll do is we'll declare an entity here. So first we need the doc type. Okay, now when we send this, do we get an error? No, okay, cool. So no error, so we can go ahead and at least declare entities. Can we actually reference the entity here? Ampersand test. Okay, so it's saying invalid product ID, but we're not actually getting reflection of our declared entity. So the error doesn't actually return the product ID. So in this case, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to try to do some type of out of band confirmation to confirm that this XML is being processed. So what we can also try instead, just because we're not getting the, the content of product ID return doesn't necessarily mean that this is not parsing this entity. What we could do is we could try to declare an entity that doesn't exist and see if we get some type of entity error which we do. So we do get a parsing error. So that's expected. So now we've actually confirmed that it's not only parsing the XML, but it's actually looking and referencing that entity. So what we can do is instead of doing an in-band call, we can use systems to do an out-of-band call. So what we'll do is we'll have this point to our collaborator server. So what we can do is go to burp, go to collaborator client, copy the clipboard, paste it here, forward slash for good measure. We need to make sure that we're referencing the entity here. So if we reference test, send. Now we're getting an invalid product ID. But if we look at this collaborator client, we click pull now, we can see that we have DNS and HTTP. So we have a DNS lookup here, and we also have an HTTP request sent to our collaborator server. Now, before we get super caught up in why we did this and what's the reasoning behind this, Let's go ahead and do the next two labs, because what this will do is this will actually let us exfiltrate data and then we can come back and talk about why we even did this in the first place. So if we go to lab number four, it's pretty much the same thing as lab number three. It's just an alternative way to um, essentially do XXE. So with declaration of entities, you can do a standard declaration of entities in this case, like we did on the left here, where you declare the entity and you reference it using an ampersand. Um, there's also an option called parameter entities and parameter entities are an alternate way 
of declaring and referencing entities. So we'll dive into that with this lab. Okay, so we jumped into the lab. Let's go ahead and click on view details. Application functionality looks pretty much the same. We, we click check stock and that sends that XML post body. And what we'll do is we'll just copy this entity declaration here just for ease from the last lab. And again, what this is gonna do is it's going to, it declares the doc type and an external entity that points to our exploit server or our collaborator server. So what we'll do here, just to keep it simple, is keep it in collaborator. But you know you can alternatively use the exploit server from the last video. If I send that, we get no error because we declared the entity, but we didn't reference it. So if we reference it here, ampersand test, you'll see the application response with an error. Entities, entities aren't allowed for security reasons. So what's happening is there's either a blacklist or some type of XML parser configuration that's preventing us from declaring general entities within the XML document. But we can alternatively use what are called parameter entities. And the only difference is we can basically reference this entity within this doc type. So what we can do instead is, re instead of referencing it here, what we do is within the entity declaration, we go ahead and add a percent sign right before the actual name of the entity. And then before the closing of this doc type, what we can do is we can go ahead and reference that here. So percent test semicolon. And then when we send that, so you can see that we still got that callback from the server, which is great. So even though the application had preventions in place that didn't allow for us to reference entities within the XML document, we're actually able to use parameter entities to reference these entities within the doc type. So it's a way to bypass some blacklist, some blacklist if you come across that. So if you ever come across this, you're able to declare entities, but you're not able to reference them, you might want to try parameter entities to see if that works instead. Okay, so now it's time to actually exfiltrate some data out of band. So we jump to our normal workflow. So first things first, we declare our doc type. And then after that, we declare our entity. And this entity we're gonna call is gonna be called load DTD. And why is it called that? Well, it's load DTD because it's, it's going to actually load an externally referenced DTD file. So in this case, we're gonna reference our exploit server. So we go ahead and pull that up. And in a normal scenario, you would host this DTD file somewhere else. So you'd hold, host it on your VPS or on an internal machine that the application can reach. But this should be a resource that the application can reach that is where you can host your DTD file. And the reason we have to host that DTD file is because we actually need to stack entities. And I'll go into that in a little bit. So first we have our clean definition. And we'll go ahead and reference that parameter entity load DTD here in the doc type. So now when this, uh, when the XML parser handles our XML, it's going to look for a DTD file at our exploit server at forward slash exploit. That looks clean. So what we need to do is we need to give, or we need to host a DTD file that has some entities declared. In this case, we're gonna have two and a half, basically three. So the first entity is gonna be called file. And it's basically going to, it's basically going to reference the resource that we're trying to access. In this case, we're just getting a file called Etsy hostname. Now, if we're exfiltrating data out of band and we're using HTTP, uh, there is a challenge when you have a multi-line file. So if you have Etsy password, a lot of times the application parser, when it tries to send that uh, request or exfiltrate that data out of band to your HTTP server, that multi-line file will cause some errors. So you actually won't even be able to exfiltrate that data sometimes. So the solution usually is using FTP, file transfer protocol. That's my go-to. But unfortunately, with Port Swigger Academy setup or Web Security Academy setup, you can't really host an FTP server and have it talk to it. So I'm setting up a lab um, on my own time that hopefully can actually let us like demo this live. So keep an eye out for something like that in the future. But for now, here we are. So uh, the next entity we're going to call stack. And you'll see why in a second. Because basically what we're doing is we're going to declare an entity within an entity. So we'll call this entity here xfill. And the reason we're calling it xfill is because it's going to be an HTTP request again to our exploit server. But instead of requesting the DTD file, what it's going to do is it's actually going to send an HTTP request to our attacker controlled server with the contents of file appended to the end of the, of the request URL. So in this case, the contents of Etsy hostname are going to actually be appended to this HTTP request to our external server, essentially allowing us allowing for us to exfiltrate 
the contents of this file out of band. So we have the file, we have the stack, we'll go ahead and declare it. So load DTD is also already referenced. It's going to fetch this DTD file. File is going to get the contents of Etsy hostname. Stack creates an entity xfill, which sends a request to our server and appends the contents of file. So the only thing we need to really reference is stack and xfill here. So we'll reference stack. It's a parameter entity and we'll try to reference xfill here, but I think they don't allow for um, entity declaration outside of the doc type, right? Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll have to actually make this a parameter entity. Now the challenge here is because we're declaring this entity within another entity, instead of us just using a percent sign here, we're going to have to use what's called a character reference, which references the character using its hex value. So ampersand pound x25 semicolon in this case. That should evaluate to the percent sign that we need for this declaration. So let's store the exploit, send the request, and take a look at the access log. That looks good to me. We got two requests from the same source. One was to exploit, and the other one was again to our server, but with the hostname appended. So what we can do is we can try to submit that solution, see if it's correct, and it looks like we're good. Let's break it down one more time. Why, first of all, why do we do this? The reason we're doing out-of-band exfiltration is because the response doesn't return what's within product ID or store ID. There's no application error that's saying, oh, that entity that you're declaring or referencing, um, yeah, here's the contents of it. So because of that, we have to look for out-of-band data exfiltration. And to do out-of-band data exfiltration, we need to do two things. One, we declare an entity, so we have to be able to actually have this application talk outbound. So if there's any egress filtering, this might not work. But we need to go ahead and have this application or this XML parser fetch our entity. And what this entity looks like is, excuse me, <laughs> we have the XML parser fetch our externally hosted DTD. And that's what load DTD is. Then from there, we have this file entity, which is the referenced data we want to get, whether it be a system file, or we want the application to send a request somewhere, we want to see the response, whatever it is. Then we have an entity within an entity. We have stack and we have xfill. xfill sends the data out of band and appends file to the end of it. And then we reference all three within this post request. And that's essentially out of band exfiltration. It looks messy when you look at it initially, but once you kind of follow the flow and follow the logic a little bit, it starts to make more sense. You'll play with some errors. In this case, if we tried to declare, or if we tried to declare xfill, in this post body, we'd have an issue, so we had to use a parameter entity. But at the end of the day, this is generally the type of payload you're going to use to exfiltrate data out of band. So we covered a lot in this first video. We talked about the basics of entities and a couple things you could do with external entity injection, such as exfiltrate local files and also the responses to the requests that we've sent via SSRF. There's a few other things you could do as well too, like technically denial of service with the billion laughs attack, or even RCE in very specific conditions. But for the most part, Exploitation of XXE is going to result in exfiltration of sensitive data. But that's all I got for this first video. The second video should be fun. It'll cover the rest of the labs, which includes some advanced exploitation techniques. But we also answer an important question, and that's when would I try this actual exploitation technique in the wild? What indication would the application give me that I should even try this advanced exploitation technique? And we'll go in depth in that in the next video. Stay tuned for that. See you next time.